Greetings, everybody. Um, I think we're going to just get started. Um, my name is Dana Mortensen, um, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of World Savvy. Um, Hi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Courtney Bell, and I am the program manager of culturally relevant instruction for St. Paul Public Schools and the founder and primary consultant or principal consultant of Courtney S. Bell Consulting, LLC. And we're going to get started. I'm going to share my screen here and get us going with the title of our presentation, which is what's culture got to do with it? Um, understanding the interdependence of culture, teaching, and learning. And so I feel really fortunate. Our format for this keynote is going to be a bit of a fireside chat slash case study um, because I've had the good fortune of working with Courtney for many years and she's a master educator and has really um, done an amazing job merging what so many of us in the global education community think of as a globally competent ped pedagogy and teaching practice with culturally responsive approaches to teaching um, and has done this to, made this magic in her own classroom. So I'm excited um, Thank you. To, to be with you today. So Courtney, I, I, maybe I'll let you start by just telling the group a little bit about your background and your journey in education um, before we get we dive in deeper. Absolutely. So um, again, my name is Courtney Bell and I should have said before anything that I am an educator. Um, and I consider myself to be an emancipatory educator um, and a scholar-centered educator. And I specifically taught high school social studies um, to ninth grade scholars for four years. Um, and it was the best four years of my life. And currently um, I am working in a district wide instructional leadership role, but I deeply miss my scholars. Um, going a little bit into my background, I did grow up in a community called North Minneapolis where North High School um, that I taught at is located. And I actually attended North High School for four years and graduated in the class of 2007. And I think that in many ways, when I left high school, I felt, hmm, I felt a sense of urgency around educational inequity and educational inequality because I received what I perceived to be an inequitable education in many aspects. Um, and so therefore I knew when I left high school that I wanted to do something about it. It, it took for me to um, start my studies in sociology to really understand that educational inequity was a social, um, a social phenomenon that really could be tackled if someone genuinely understood it from a systemic level and had the heart to do the work on the ground. And so when I decided to become a social studies teacher, I knew that the only place I wanted to teach was at my alma mater, North High School, and I did have that wonderful opportunity to do that for four years. And at North, I did have the opportunity to teach African American history, as well as sociology, human geography, and the cultures of cultures of the African diaspora. So Thanks. yes. Thanks, Courtney. Um, and for those of you um, in the keynote that I, I have not met or encountered in the global education world, uh, my name is Dana Mortensen. I'm a co-founder, along with Madiha Murshed, who's in Bangladesh, um, and the current CEO of World Savvy. Um, we're a national education nonprofit that um, really is, and I'll shift slides now, works with schools and communities to make sure all youth are prepared for our complex global future. So we're really looking at how do you deeply embed global competence into teaching, learning, and culture in a K-12 environment? Um, and to do that through the lens of equity so that all students, regardless of background and circumstance and where they are in the US are able to build those kinds of skills we know students need to thrive when they're out, out of high school. Um, so we've been around for 18 years this coming this spring um, and worked with um, over 730,000 students um, across about uh, 29 states and 12 countries. So and about 6,000 teachers. Teachers really are the heartbeat of this work. And what I'm so thrilled about today is um, to be able to be in conversation with Courtney about how this really happens. Um, so much of World Savvy's work is about thinking about global education through the local context. What does it look like to make meaning of complex situations, circumstances, subjects that are happening around the world, but in ways that are very relevant um, 
in, and localized and personalized for young people. And Courtney models that in an incredible way. Um, before I dive into sort of more of our fireside chat, to ground the discussion a, a little bit, um, there's four evidence-based principles that um, World Savvy thinks of when we think about how to build global competence, both for students, for teachers, and also um, for school leadership. And, and one is cultivating connections. So this idea of connections between people, connections between issues across subjects, um, across identities, we believe everyone's identity is fluid um, and changes over time um, and changes in relationship to circumstance. And so this, this uh, intentional and um, sort of meaningful way of approaching trying to build collaboration and connections across differences at the core. The second is active and interdisciplinary learning um, where young people can be curious, challenge assumptions, um, that we really look at young people as the experts in their own lived experience and yeah. count on them to make connections between that and what they encounter in school and that we hold a very high bar um, as educators for ourselves to think about how we both deliver pedagogy and content that allows them to do that effectively. Um, and um, promoting environments that are student driven. Um, which is you know, historically not really how K-12 education was set up, but in order to build these global citizenship and the competencies to make sure that these are student-driven learning environments. Um, the third uh, principle, our evidence-based principle is fostering knowledge to action. So we are uh, world savvy and Courtney can speak to this as we get into our fireside chat. Really, we don't believe that youth have potential in the future as agents of change, but that they have that right now, that they are leaders, that they are powerful, that they have agency and what they lack um, in some environments is the opportunity to leverage that agency to actually take informed action. And so in all of the work, we're trying to create opportunities to really extend beyond discussion and into action. And the fourth is reflection and adaptation. Um, believing that building global competency and global education is not a linear journey uh, for any students um, or teachers for that matter. And that we really are looking to um, embed into the experience both self-reflection and introspection about who we are and what we bring into the classroom as educators and also how we teach that and, and cultivate that environment for students so that they move through their own educational journey knowing that reflection is a valued part of learning. Um, so those are the four principles and Courtney and I are going to engage in a discussion today and a little bit of a case study about what she created in her classroom that brings together these three pillars. Um, this idea of merging culturally responsive instruction with a globally competent pedagogy for and real authentic scholar engagement and that to us that's what engaged global citizenship really looks like. And so this is kind of the powerful combination of those things and we're going to dive deep into looking at the practice of it. Um, for those who are interested, um, a lot of this work pivots off of a global competence matrix that is on World Savvy's website, worldsavvy.org, that um, sort of unpacks indicators, values, uh, skills, behaviors um, for global competence that can be found there. Um, so I'm gonna dive right in and start with this beautiful picture of Courtney and her scholars. And Courtney, just ask you to kind of take us back uh, 2014 and unpack this story of your participation in World Savvy Classrooms, um, you know, setting the stage, what the course was, tell us about your scholars and tell us about how your own background as an educator kind of um, influenced how you approached this work. Um, and the, the Classrooms program for everyone listening in is a project-based, project and inquiry-based learning model that is encouraging young people to explore issues they're passionate about um, that leads to taking community action. So yeah, let's just dive in, Courtney. Tell me about oh, setting yeah. the stage for us. Yes, so I'm gonna set the stage in first thing that um, my scholars and I, there were they were all ninth graders and I was teaching human geography this particular semester. And I led my classroom in many instances um, from a thematic base. And we were, I, I saved, I, I scheduled my class um, in my curriculum to align with the World Savvy Competition where we were going to be looking at um, urban geography in this particular time frame. And, you know, the textbooks, I, I, the textbooks that I could have used to teach this 
particular, um, I guess, section of geography, I found that they, they didn't really have a lot of relevant content that addressed the lived experiences of my scholars every day in the city. And while there were some um, aspects of urban geography that I felt would be valuable for them to understand, um, I felt that I could cover that, but do it in a way where they were going to be leading their learning and their, their learning was going to be relevant. Now, the reason that I was attracted to World Savvy as a, the World Savvy's classroom program is because it was a student-centered um, a student-centered competition that ultimately allowed um, scholars to lead from what was locally happening in their community, from the perspective of what was locally happening in their communities, and then to branch it out to what was happening nationally and then internationally. And I knew that there were a host of issues taking place right in the um, part of the city that we were located, which is North Minneapolis. And from society standpoint, there were a lot of negative things that had always been said in the media, different topics such as crime and things that I felt were negatively um, skewed in many lights um, and that my scholars and I felt were not a fair depiction of North Minneapolis as a whole. But nonetheless, we started focusing in on issues that directly impacted my scholars. And so um, I opened up the class as usual with a, with a discussion. And I asked my scholars, what are some issues that, are you, that you are facing or that you are seeing right here in the city? specifically in North Minneapolis. And there was a multitude of the different things that were listed, but most of them um, reach back to um, realities for those living in the city, living below poverty lines, and ultimately um, issues that were resulting in their neighborhoods. And there was a lot of talk um, from my scholars about this phenomena that they noticed where they were being made to move, their families were moving um, and they were moving further away from North Minneapolis and they didn't necessarily know why. They also started talking about all this new infrastructure in the community. They started talking about the building of these, of these really nice apartment complexes in, in, in condo style um, buildings and the, the rising of new businesses that had never existed in, and so from there, I said, okay, okay. Now, in my mind, my teacher light bulb went off. I said, what they're describing is gentrification. Um, but in that moment, they didn't know that that's what they were describing. But I'm a firm believer, and I told my scholars this constantly, you all are sociologists. You are sociologists and you are historians. There is no better person to speak to the social realities of the world than those who are socially oppressed in, in, in more than one capacity. And so my scholars were describing something firsthand that most um, university level scholars have never actually experienced. And so I knew that this was gonna be huge um, and I knew that they were going to lead it. Um, and so pretty much in a nutshell, I did the, um, you know, I facilitated some learning around, I used James Baldwin, um, James Baldwin, A Talk to Teachers. And there's a segment in James Baldwin, A Talk to Teachers, where he talks about the city that he grew up in New York. He talked about New York, but he talked about downtown and how it was so fancy and it was clean. And at the end he, of, the, of, the, of the paragraph, he said, I knew that this place was not for me. This place that was shiny with all these stores and all these nice things, I knew it wasn't for me, but the question was, who is it for? So then that led a deeper discussion. So these new houses, these new, these new um, businesses that are being built in the community, um, but at the same time, you and your families are being moved out to these, these suburban and rural areas that you don't know. So you're not getting to benefit from the, I guess, the beautifying of, of your home, your city that you know. And for my scholars, that brought a lot of emotion. For me, it brought a lot of emotion because I grew up in North Minneapolis and that is my home community as well. So then I asked them, okay. So I said, this is a social phenomenon and it's happening. 
I asked them how they felt about it. They expressed themselves. They told me they, that they were frustrated. They were angry. They were confused. They didn't know what was happening, but they knew what was happening. I then taught them about gentrification. So I explained the technical terminology and what it looked like, to which their light bulbs started like just illuminating because they're like, yeah, that, that's what it is. That's what's happening. And I'm like, now what do you want to do about it? And they said, we don't know, but we want to do something. And I said, well, what do you want to do? They said, we want to tell people what's happening. I said, okay, well, how do you want to do it? So then I had three class periods who were doing human geography, who were a part of this work. So this wasn't just one class. This was three different class periods with me as the educator. And I had a total of 60 plus scholars between these three classes. And I had each of the three class periods take a vote. What do you want to do? How do you want to bring this information to the community and to your families? They said, we want to create a documentary. Now, as a teacher, I'm like, why? <laughs> I'm like, why couldn't they say they wanted to do a video? I mean, not a video, a, a, a poster board, you know, something that, you know, would be easy. They said a documentary. I had never made a documentary. <laughs> um, this was only my second year teaching geography, to, to which, by the way, I did not take any geography courses in college. So I was not familiar with geography. Um, so I was learning as they were learning, but they didn't know that. And I had never made a documentary. But I said, you know what? They're engaged. They're excited. They want to do it. And if I have to learn something new so that they can do it, I'm going to do just that. And then fast forward three months later, we have a documentary. They presented at World Savvy and they win in the senior division category. And it was just, it was just a phenomenal experience. And my eyes were filled with tears the entire time because they, it was work that they led that was local, but they were able to branch it out to understand that it was a national and international phenomenon that was affecting communities such as Harlem um, and Brooklyn, as well as um, parts of Kenya. And that's how they, and so each class period, one class period had local, gentrification in Minneapolis, in North Minneapolis, one group had um, national and they looked at the examples of Brooklyn and um, Harlem. And then one group had the Kibera, um, the Kibera township of Kenya. So yeah. Amazing. I want to, I want to press a little bit too, before we move into kind of unpacking that process as I transition to our next uh, piece of the conversation. I remember you talking quite a bit about you're coming from traditional teacher ed programs, yep. um, a style of teaching that's really sort of letting go and facilitating student-driven learning is not necessarily what folks are coming out of teacher ed programs prepared to do. So, not but it's all. also really essential for globally competent teaching, right? To build yes. these kind of independent learners. Um, talk to me about that process for you as an educator to kind of the letting go and, and mm. what did that feel like and what was required to do it? Well, first and foremost, um, it took bravery and faith. Um, and it took for me to believe that my scholars would actually rise to the occasion. Um, for me, I found myself reflecting constantly about who I was when I sat in their seats as a North High student and how much untapped potential I had and how much and how how much of a social advocate I really was, but I never got a chance to really express that because the platform wasn't created by my teachers. And so I said, I know if I had it in me, they have it in them. And so it took for me to really get over myself. I was terrified. This is a three month period of time um, in which I'm responsible for teaching them basic, basic conceptualizations around geography. And I'm like, this could go really well or this can go really bad because A, I've never made a documentary before. B, we don't have a camera. Right. C, Basic, uh, step one. Right. C, we didn't have um, a videographer. Um, 
I didn't know how to edit video. Um, we didn't have um, soft, the software that we didn't, we really probably pretty much didn't have anything besides the passion, the knowledge, and the will. That's and everything great. else came after the fact. But I think that was really essential for me in practicing um, that belief in my scholar's ability was if we fail, we fail together. Yeah, but the bravery if is, piece, but absolutely. If this, is, if this is about them and this is about their lives and this is about their communities, their families, their lived experiences, why wouldn't they engage? Yeah. And, and I, the skin and, in the and, game and, there for you as well. Yes. And I am not a gambling woman, but I will say I gambled a lot in my classroom and I never lost <laughs> because yeah. my scholars always carry through so yeah. I want to take it back a little bit um so I, I mean having spent some time in your classroom I know what a special place it was and when we think about you know there are folks in this uh watching this keynote that are from all around the world um may or may not know North Minneapolis we're going to unpack a bit later this sort of um persistent culture of low expectations among youth but before we get there even just basically talking about laying this groundwork the things that we talked about being so important to creating the kind of classroom where this could even be possible, right? And isolating yeah. some of those elements. Um, and we've shared them here, this yeah. idea of establishing trust, scholar-centered framing, transparency, valuing the lived experience, personal to local, and then language matters. And I wanna start with the trust people. Like you, you've, you've said to me before, Courtney, that you can't even begin to understand how the depth of this kind of local global work and action oriented work could have happened without the trust, the foundation of trust. I wonder if you can help to share in this environment some of the things that you really did intentionally to create trust, yes. to build trust. Yes, absolutely. So um, I'm a firm believer that culture is a fancy word for lived experience. So one's culture and their way of seeing the world is a result of their lived experiences and what they've, what they've seen, what they've, what they've done, where they've been. And I believe that trust is built when a person is vulnerable enough to share that with others without fear of judgment or fear of rejection. So my scholars did not have to know that I came from North Minneapolis. They didn't, I didn't have to share that with them. I didn't have to share with them that I went to North High School. I didn't have to share with them that I shared in on a lot of the social realities um, and that they endure, that they lived through every day. I didn't have to share that with them. Um, and in fact, I've learned, in fact, I've learned that many people, for whatever reason, do not share who they are and what they come from. Because we live in a world that says it's not where you come from, it's where you're at. But I challenge that to say it's very much so about where you come from. Because where you come from, it doesn't dictate where you will go, but it does dictate in many aspects who you are. Um, and so I built trust with my scholars, first of all, by letting them know who I was and where I came from letting them know that I was proud of who I was and where I came from, showing that, modeling that, and then constantly pushing them to feel that same pride in their identity and to understand that they were scholars. They were genuinely scholars with the ability to create knowledge, not just be passive recipients. Um, I talked a lot with my scholars. Um, classroom, my classroom was always discussion-based where they could facilitate the discussion. Many times we would come in the room and my scholars would start the conversation on their own. What's going on in the world today? What y'all see on Facebook? What's, what's, what's trending on Twitter? And then my job as the educator was to spin it and say, okay, now here's how we look at that through a sociological frame. Here's how we look at that through a historical frame, a geographic frame, you know, a cultural frame. Um, and really, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I am not, um, I think a lot of the times when people think about a culturally responsive educator, or they think about an educator that builds relationships with their scholars, they think that they're like this, this warm and fuzzy, like kumbaya singing educator that's like, hey, you know, 
Um, I just, I, I just want you to be able to do whatever you want. I'm your friend. No, my scholars will tell you clear as day. Miss Bell does not play. That's what they would say. <laughs> Miss Bell does not play, which means Miss Bell is going to hold you to high standards. Miss Bell is not going to accept anything less than your best. Miss Bell, but really at the base of that, Miss Bell loves you, and that's why. Um, and it was through those high expectations that I also was able to facilitate that trust because when you see somebody expects greatness of you, it, it makes you kind of, it, it's a little weird at first, but then it's like somewhere in all of that, you care for me. And so therefore I trust you because I know that you want the best for me. And why wouldn't you trust someone who wants the best for you? So, yeah. And nothing that I did in my classroom would have been possible without that trust. <laughs> I want to, I mean, I want to ask one more question that's sort of in this language matters piece, because something that's always struck me um, in this field of global education, there are um, equity issues. There are assumptions made that sort of trend towards Maslow's hierarchy of, well, those kids aren't ready for it. There's a deficit based lens sometimes um, in education generally around students that are coming from um, backgrounds where they've been oppressed or marginalized. And so yeah. your use of the scholar centered framing, I've never heard you say students. I don't think, I don't think I've ever heard you say students. It's ever come out of your mouth. I'm wondering not just how explicitly you spoke about that or whether you just created it as an expectation with your students or whether you unpack the why, but also this idea of how much language matters when you're trying to build that agency for young people to take on these huge issues. You and I have talked about the fact that, and this is from the tra this Trabian Shorter writes about this, um, that you can't lift people up by putting them down, um, how to talk about race and poverty without using deficit-based language. And for the group, this article is in Chronicle Philanthropy, but um, that it w sometimes in the interest of pointing out injustices, disparities, and needs, people associate all those problems with the people who've experienced them. Yes. Um, so you end up with things like at-risk youth, um, minorities in high crime neighborhoods, um, disadvantaged communities. And you, you really worked a lot around reframing of language so that as your scholars are examining poverty globally, it's coming from a place of not inhabiting and internalizing those labels as something that becomes limiting. Um, yes. I wonder if you can talk more about that and what conversations it developed for your scholars. Yes. So I first want to give a shout out to um, the Children's Defense Fund um, Freedom Schools movement. Um, in many aspects, my pedagogy was developed through being a servant learner intern in the Freedom Schools program um, the summer before I started teaching at North. And we were, we learned very early on that we were not to call our scholars students because they were not gonna be passive recipients of information. And we were going, the framing of every aspect of what we did from the curriculum to the pedagogy that we were trained, the pedagogical style we were trained in was that you, we are expecting greatness. We are expecting them to create. We are expecting them to um, evaluate, analyze, um, and, and apply. And so that, those are, that is the work of a scholar. Anybody, yeah. anybody can say that. Anybody knows that. When you start thinking about researchers, what are they doing? They're evaluating, they're analyzing, they're creating, right? A student is only receiving information, only receiving information. They are passive recipients. And I knew that I was gonna call my scholars to be scholars. So why would I call them a student when I knew that what I was expecting of them was greater than that? I knew that I was asking of them more than just understanding and listening. I needed them to create. And so really, it was a matter of, I'm going to call you, I'm going to call on you in the way that I would like you to show up. And they understand, and it just caught on like wildfire for them. Because they, yeah. they looked and they said, well, wait a minute now. And I always explained to them from the beginning what a scholar is. And my conceptualization of a scholar is a creator of knowledge. And so, you know, is, you get a different response from a young person when you say you're a scholar. And 
I expect you to show up as such. They don't, they don't get to say, well, I don't think I'm, I don't think I want to do that today. No. What you get is, is their best. And whatever, wherever their best shows up at, wherever, if there's a space in which they lack, it's your job as the educator to fill that void, to provide the resource, to facilitate the, the understanding, and then to stand back and watch them show you what they know. It's an affirming asset-based way of framing it, and I've, I've always loved it. And the consistency that you applied it is just incredibly impressive. I just, you know, the thing I want to talk about too, which is in in education in the U.S. is sort of the elephant in the room or not. It's you know, it's is that we've got an 83% white teaching workforce right yeah. across the country where yeah. um, representation is not always there. Oftentimes, you will have a, a, an educator. Um, you know, with a group of students that don't share lived experience in that background. And so I'm going to shift to this slide is um, from Zaretta Hammond's work, but would love for you, we've talked so much about, yes, in this instance, you did share um, a lot of commonalities in terms of lived experience with youth and you, that's part of how you leverage trust, but that it's possible to, to find those entry points to build trusting relationships regardless of that common experience. I would love for you to just speak to that sort of where, what are we looking at on the slide right now? Yes. What did it mean to you? Where'd you come in at it? And then what, what is your advice and perspective for folks who are not in a classroom, standing in a classroom, trying to bring this global education to students when they don't share um, as many common experiences? Yes. yes. So first and foremost, um, this trust generator chart um, comes from the book, Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain authored by Zaretta Hammond. Um, she is a brilliant educator in neurosciences, and she created what is called the Ready for Rigor Framework, which focuses, which is a, a, um, a toolkit of sorts for educators to show up in culturally responsive ways um, and to come from a culturally responsive mindset, um, to teach from a culturally responsive mindset and to um, behave in a responsive way in the classroom with scholars. And so this trust generator chart ultimately is defining different ways in which trust is built and what it looks like in the classroom. And so I'm looking at the different categories. The selective vulnerability is what I described earlier, which was me sharing with my scholars who I was um, as a student from North High, who I was as a kid growing up in North Minneapolis, um, and why I wanted more for myself and for my education, even if it wasn't necessarily presented as, as um, an option by those who were charged with my education. Um, but I'm looking at this chart and I'm looking at it and I'm saying, the first thing I wanna say and debunk the myth that you have to look like your students in order to build relationships with them. That is absolutely the furthest thing from the truth. And in many instances, I believe that it has become a crutch in teaching circles um, to say, you know, I'm so different from my children and or from the children that I teach. I'm so different from them. I, I just can't relate. They can't relate to me. And as a result, um, no learning transpires. But here's the reality. If there's no, teaching is a very intimate act. You cannot expect anyone to take your word as bond if you don't have a relationship with them. How many strangers could come up to you on the street that you don't know and trust and tell you something that's supposed to be fact from their perspective and you accept it without knowing them? Um, I would hope no one could do that <laughs> because then that would make one um, naive to say the least. Um, but you have to do the work as an educator to build the trust. And the wonderful thing about this, the trust generator chart is that it gives you different ways that you can do it. So, and the cool part about it is, is that no aspect of it focuses on the different rings of culture. It doesn't focus on ethnicity. It doesn't focus on nationality, socioeconomic status, um, gender, sexual orientation, um, none of it. It doesn't focus on any of those things. So any educator can look for these points of, of, of access, um, especially in the areas of similarities of interest. But I think the most important one is concern. Yeah. 
concern. People connect with another who shows concern for the issues and events that are important to them. So in the case of my scholars, I showed that concern by uh, making them partners in their education and asking them what was important to them and then wrapping their learning around it. That built trust. Yeah. Um, it's, it, most educators feel that it's enough to just be competent in their content area. And yes, if you believe someone knows what they're talking about, there is a trust because you believe what they say. You say they seem knowledgeable, they seem competent. I trust that what they're saying is true, but it's, that's not enough. Yeah. And so, yeah. Build the relationship. And this is a good transition to another conversation that we've had quite a bit. And I think when we're talking about global education um, through this lens of, uh, particularly when it applies to um, youth who may have lived experience where, you know, you've, you've described that there's, there's issues in the community that students are looking at, they see, they want to take action on them, and that there's an assumption that, you know, how are you going to extend that beyond, let's focus on the basics, this, this mm -hmm. notion of focusing on the basics for students that, um, that have been marginalized. And one of the things that, um, that comes up, and sorry, I actually don't know if you want to talk about the rings of culture first before we get into this low expectation culture, because you've mentioned um, the work of Dr. Sharaki Holly quite a bit in also um, as a framework that's a good one to lean on when thinking about it. So I'll let you comment on that a bit before I move on. Sorry about that. Yeah. So the rings of culture um, is really extremely important because it make it helps people to understand that all people have culture all people. So when we talk about culturally responsive instruction, most people, whether they realize it or not, they're thinking about racially relevant instruction. They're thinking about ethnically relevant instruction. But culture is encompassing of all of these different areas and every person, regardless of where they are from, falls within these rings. And those, and they fall within rings that aren't even named. So we have to, as educators, understand that we are cultured individuals and that our scholars are cultured individuals and that culture is individualistic because depending on who you are, you're gonna have a different experience. And when I, the work, my work that I lead in St. Paul, I am doing a lot of work around capacity building and mindset shifting. And the Rings of Culture is really helping me to lead this work along with Zaretta Hammond's work on culturally responsive teaching in the brain because when you all of a sudden realize that everyone is cultured and that what you, what you think of when you think of culture is not just ethnicity, it's also age, gender, religion, socioeconomic status, um, orientation, um, all these different things, when you start to think about it like that, it really makes you realize that we are all human beings and that we often ultimately have to be able to step back and practice cultural humility. And as an educator, you have to also realize and take that pressure off your back that says, I have to be culturally competent. It is impossible to be the knower of all cultures. You, you, you can't understand all of your students' cultures because you might look at them and say, well, society says that this is an African-American child and culturally this is, what they, this is how they behave. But you cannot prescribe that to people. You cannot prescribe cultural stereotypes to people. Instead, you have to make your scholars a partner in their education and let them show up who, as who they authentically are culturally. And this, you know, Courtney, we've talked before how you sort of transcend the Food Flag Festival um, sort of into a deeper exploration seems like a framework that helps us to be reminded of when we're exoticizing or othering cultures, yes. even when it's well intended um, in the yes. interest of learning more. Yes. And I think it's always struck me as a way of grounding. I think particularly when you're when we're looking at um, racial equity and training around this, around when educators who are white educators look at their own identity, there's an assumption that they're absent of culture and that yes. the focus has been on. Yes. And I think your work has really brought to the surface that this is 
it is universally something that is deserving of deep exploration and introspection yeah. in order to show up in a space where we can enhance and deepen our understanding and our cross-cultural learning, yes. um, which has been pretty incredible. Um, and sorry for the hiccup, but what I was coming to is a conversation that really comes back to um, what externally, um, for, you know, those who don't live in Minneapolis, in Minneapolis or in Minnesota, you know, the, the scholars that you taught would have been, you know, defined by those deficit-based characteristics, right? Yeah. And not just in Minneapolis and not just at North, but across the, the country, there's even mm -hmm. um, sometimes well-intentioned efforts by educators and others to sort mm -hmm. of protect or to sort of make sure students are actually ready for the kind of rigor or the kind of complexity or the kind of depth that would be required to, to tackle these complex global issues and to be mm -hmm. change makers in that space. Um, and I wanna talk about what that looks like. And again, I've got um, one of Zaretta Hammond's charts up here for you to talk through because we talked about how that shows up quite a bit as the sentimentalist, mm -hmm. this idea of actually feeling love and protection and um, wanting to do right by students that are either refugee students, English language learner students, students who are coming in from backgrounds that are different than the educator and a desire to shield them and what's the consequence of that and what does it look like um, in the classroom? Yeah. Um, so the thing about it is, is that um, I want to focus in on the sentimentalist um, pedagogy and how there is a focus on building rapport and trust and there is warmth expressed, but there are excuses that are made for a student's lack of academic performance. Um, curriculum is watered down. Um, students are, um, educators attempt to protect as they believe, um, or as they believe that they are doing, protect students from what Zaretta Hammond calls productive struggle um, in their academic work. Um, and really ultimately what it, what it contributes to is not only a culture of low expectations, but a culture of non-learning. Um, I've seen it firsthand. And spaces where sentimentalist pedagogy is, is the norm, learning often does not take place. And when we start talking about developing, developing global citizens, we start talking about developing culturally competent scholars, when we start talking about um, shaping the change makers of the next generation, it's not going to happen with a sentimentalist pedagogy. It's just not. Um, I think people need to understand that um, the protection that one believes that they're, that they're fostering is actually putting a young person in harm's way. Because yeah. once they're done with school, where's their ability to think critically? Where's their ability to articulate critically? Where's their ability to, to read, write, um, and, and ultimately contribute to society? Yeah. So, and we've talked, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, we've talked about, when you think about going back to this knowledge to action framework, the idea that students can take what they're learning and make meaning of it and really take action you know, address the inequity that they see, address the challenges. Um, yeah. We, you know, the, the year after your students did a documentary, you had a group of young women that did, um, through the medium of interpretive dance, an analysis of the sexualization of the black female body. And it just blew me away, sort of the depth, these are ninth graders, the depth of the exploration of the history of that topic, it's contemporary, um, it's application, not just in their local community, but writ large, it's roots across the globe, Mm -hmm. This, um, and then, you know, while you, that's, that's an example of what ninth graders are capable of with a warm demander, right? Yes. Um, whereas many of uh, students that may have come to the same environment might have had a much more surface level approach on the solution side or even the exploration side, right? It's sort of a, a bake sale for a well. It's not to say that raising money for things in other countries isn't, isn't um, a good way to express care, but this mm -hmm. idea of the depth when you really get in there with students, they can produce things of that sort of level of engagement. Um, exactly. And it's stuck with me in thinking about that. And there's also the, the reason, the, first of all, I wanna say, I don't take any credit for my scholars' work. Like, 
the example of my two scholars who did the interpretive dance, um, that was all them. They are, they are dancers and they are, they are artists. And this is what happens when you as the educator step back from being the instructor into a role of being a facilitator and a resource. Um, Cause that's what teachers are supposed to be facilitators and resources. And so when I look at this chart, the warm demander, that is me 1000%. And it's so affirming to see it written down. It's a little weird too, cause it's just like, mm, how do they know me? Like they don't know me, but yet I'm, I'm described here in this way. And as I said, I was not that educator. I'm not an educator that is extremely kumbaya, uh, you know, in my stance. I'm not like, I'm not even necessarily, I'm not going to say that I'm not friendly. I am friendly, but you know, I, I have a tough love stance most of the time. Um, and there's a time for everything. There's a time for laughing. There's a time for playing, but then there's a time to get down to work. And, and, and my scholars knew, they always knew what time it was. Um, but the thing about it is, is that the warm demander pedagogy engages and, and encourages productive struggle. That documentary was a productive struggle. Yeah. You know, there are different projects on different topics from redlining to the over-sexualization of Black women through dance. Um, all these different topics, those were all grounded in their cultural understandings and experiences from the different rings of culture and I just provided the platform um you know by way of the world savvy um world savvy classroom competition and the resources and then gave them scaffolded some back help some background information um just for the the overarching social themes that that their topics were falling under yeah and you you've gone further to talk I'll skip to this quote that, that's from quite some time ago. And so it's dated um, as well um, around, oh, I skipped too far, sorry. Um, which is really underscoring what you've said, right? That, that we're in a situation where um, many students who come from backgrounds that would have been described as disadvantaged or marginalized in some way, socially oppressed, um, are that, that there's there's a teaching down. And I think when we're thinking about global citizenship and building these kinds of um, asset-based framings, but also the kinds of competencies that are gonna allow students to leave and really be problem solvers and change makers, that this is something that needs to be unpacked and productive struggle needs to be central to the development of global citizenship. So mm -hmm. I wanna come back and talk about this dependent and independent learner frame and, and we can kind of wrap on this and take a couple of questions and, um, and I'll end with, um, you know, one of the quotes that I think we've talked about before is really thought provoking. And also to everyone else in the keynote, um, I'll share a link to the documentary um, and I will share a link to the, the press that followed for Courtney's students um, and the matrix and some other, uh, the other things that helped to frame it. But I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit about this as the independent learner as crucial to global citizenship um, would be great. Yes. So um, Zaretta Hammond um, in her book compares and contrasts the dependent learner from the independent learner and um, the scholar centered um, pedagogy and framing of the work um, that I led in my classroom was ultimately um, aiming at facilitating independent learning. Um, and as I talked about in the beginning, so it says that the independent learner relies on the teacher um, to lift the cognitive load temporarily. And so that would be categorized as like me in the beginning, laying the, fr the framework um, after getting them engaged with their own, you know, connecting the topic to their own lived experiences. But ultimately, you know, me giving them the understanding and the sociological and geographic understanding of gentrification, for instance, as a phenomena that takes place in urban, in urban environments. Um, you know, that was me doing a, some temporary cognitive lifting, but ultimately 
then it, they were released on their own to to facilitate and create. So one thing I didn't mention is that, and you'll know in the notice in the documentary, my scholars called in ac like actual professors from the University of Minnesota, from the geography department. They interviewed about three or four of them. They also communicated and got in contact and were able to interview for the documentary, the community liaison for the Metro Transit um, bus organization that was part of um, facilitating community conversations about the upcoming light rail and um, um, rapid bus lines that were going to be running through North Minneapolis. Um, I mean, it was it was a real serious project, and they facilitated. They they did it all. My job, the biggest part that I did was to help them. For instance, with the email, I I created an email framework. Um, template for them to actually write the emails, but they wrote the emails and they scheduled them and they brung in, um, scheduled the times and all of the University of Minnesota and other um, community professionals were so gracious to come into the classroom. They even set up the interview backdrop. Like they got a couple of little chairs out of my room and then made a collage of like, um, made from like black history calendars and things of that nature and made a backdrop for the interviews that you'll see in a picture. So when I say that this was led by them as independent learners, I mean just that. Um, they're genuinely brilliant. And there's a, there's a di dictionary definition for the term uneducable, which is um, deemed as someone that is incapable of learning. And what I love about my scholars is that society st statistically would like to say that they were uneducable, but they were anything but that. And yeah. all I had to do was believe. And that's all I had to do. Amazing thing to see. Amazing thing to see. And I think at the core of, um, you know, I'm going to end on this quote and then I'm going to stop sharing so we could take a couple questions. Um, this idea that productive struggle and independent learning is really a requirement around building global citizenship, the competencies for it. There isn't a question in my mind from almost 20 years in the work. And I think what's really interesting to me is that rigor is a, an, um, an overused word in education, but it's often associated with the opposite of developing things that had historically been um, compartmentalized as soft skills, which I think we should abolish as a framing. Things like cr empathy, critical thinking, collaboration, yes. um, which is embodied by all the work that you did with your students. And this, to me, the description of what you've give, provided today is, is what real rigor is. If you're going to thrive in a world of complexity and be a problem solver and a change maker, um, this is hard work to do. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing soft about it. So it's pretty amazing to be able to see that in action. And I, I want to thank you for that. Yeah, um, absolutely. and I'm going to come back with the last few minutes to our chat. Well, um, thank you for World yeah. Savvy. And, you know, it was one thing for us to create and to do this work in our classrooms, but it was another thing to have a platform that was actually a stage for my scholars. Um, I mean, just phenomenal. Just phenomenal. Yeah. And it's one thing for us to have created, but for them to know that they had a place where they were going to present and then their work was going to be taken seriously um was that was something that also engaged them and motivated them as well so thank you for such an amazing creating such an amazing platform for it's young a people. gift a gift and an honor and there's a comment in the chat box that um i just want to lift up because it's how we feel about you courtney that you are authentic real and inspiring and mm -hmm. i think one of the most important things about our work with you that's been so that is so informed how i think about the field of global education is that um you are so willing and so ready to step into space that lifts everyone up oh, as important um, and critical and capable yes. um, leaders thank in you. this space, regardless of who they are and their their the multitudes of their identities. And I think yes. that's that's been a really resonant and amazing part of how you've been effective. Um, thank you. And then in this chat box, what I'll do, so it's part of the recording, is... Um, it looks like there's just some other comments that are um, providing uh, uh, a lot of great feedback for you, Courtney, which is nice, is I will I'll provide a link to the documentary film that Courtney's um, scholars made, also to that article that followed it in the local paper. Um, and then I think Lucy, thank you, Lucy, so much, um, has actually provided some links to Zaretta Hammond, 
There's also um, a link I can provide to the article about um, lifting people up um, with asset-based language and also um, the Rings of Culture by Shiroki, Dr. Shiroki Holly um, can put a link to that there too. Um, thank so thank you everyone for having us and for being with us and, and thank you, Courtney. Thank you. Um, for just being you and sharing your experience. Thank and here's you. Lucy. Here I am. Hi Lucy. And, oh, I'm gonna echo. Ooh. Oh, okay, I was gonna say I can mute. Um, so I'm just gonna take a minute in this last piece um, to, cause I'm not sharing my screen anymore to just grab a couple of these links in the chat. So one moment. Uh, this, this is a link to the article um, that is around how we can think about um, asset-based framing when we're talking about students, um, when we're, and, and when we're talking, in general, when we're talking about communities. Um, and, and being careful not to assign deficit-based framing um, to people who have experienced um, that kind of oppression and rather to separate those out. So that's a good piece to be aware of. Um, I'm also going back to grab the link to, sorry, my adeptness at, so the actual documentary is actually on YouTube. So here is the link I'm about to share. Um, hopefully, uh, folks will get a chance to watch this because this was a really um, amazing, amazing bit of work. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, I believe you already shared Zaretta Hammond's, but Shiroki Holly's Rings of Culture um, is on culturallyresponsive.org backslash articles. So I'll put that right here for anyone interested. These are great resources. And I see a, um, I see a question someone asked. Uh, well, first of all, thank you all for all of your um, wonderful feedback and just your kind words. I really appreciate it. Oh. Um, but there, oh. Sorry. That's your, uh, hold on a sec. Sorry. That was your documentary playing. I apologize. Go ahead. Oh, it's okay. Um, but yes, to answer the question of what age group, um, my scholars were ninth graders, <laughs> um, ninth grade high school students in a nine through 12 high school. Um, and Oh, goodness. Okay. I just realized, sorry about that. I'm reposting all these links, folks, because it looks like they were going just to panelists. So... I will do that again. Apologies. Oh, I've been doing the same thing too, Dan. I, I forgot to reset it in Zoom. It yeah. yeah, and I put the culturally responsive book one in in the link just for um, us and not for the attendees. So we we actually read Zaretta's book last year at my school. We've been um, focusing on equity, inclusion, and diversity, and we had different. Um, PLCs that, that focused on different readings, and that was the one that I chose. So I'm glad to, to hear you mention it. Um, I just want to say thank you so much, Courtney and Dana, for being here. This has been really special. I like this fireside chat format. I think it's um, a good way to go. And uh, and everybody in the audience seemed to really love uh, what you had to say. So thank you again for sharing your expertise. We've been streaming in YouTube, and this will be up on YouTube, um, and we'll send you the link and that sort of thing uh, once the conference is done. But we're about to wrap up. We only have a couple more sessions to go, and I want to give you Congrats, people. Lucy. I know, I know. Um, we're You're about a, to super, super woman and superman, Steve. Yeah. Uh, it's getting easier in some ways, but it's also just, um, uh, it's, yeah, there's two of us. So what do you know? What do you know? Um, anyway, thank you. Thank you guys you. have been wonderful. And I think the thank audience really Thank you so really much. Exists, and um, uh, did you put a link into World Savvy as well, too? And so, oh, no. So, that's oh, I need to put in a link for my website as well. Yep. Yeah. It's CourtneySpellConsulting.com, right, Courtney? Are you, you yeah. got it? Yeah. I'm, yep, I'm putting it in. Thank you. Okay, got it. I'm in touch with Dana and Courtney. That's how you do it. Um, and uh, thanks for coming, everybody. We'll see Thank you. you. And that's my email too. Oh, okay. my email. Yeah, and put yours too, Courtney. It was on a slide, but I still.